Now 250,000. Now I'm gonna get 275. Five, I'm gonna get 275. Three. Now 300,000. Now three and a quarter. 325. Five, I'm gonna get three and a quarter. I'm gonna get 325. Now half. Now I'm gonna get 300. And hello from Dallas, Texas, at Lincoln Center. We are at the intersection of the LBJ Freeway and the North Dallas Tollway, and we are pleased and excited to have a couple of guests today, and one of those is the CEO and president of America Can and Texas Can, Richard Marquez. How are you, sir? Doing fine, Mike. Good morning. Good to have you with me. And then we also have Raul uh, Machuca. And Raul is the uh, senior social media director for both entities. Is that right? Yes, that's right. All right. Well, we want to welcome you too. So I'm looking forward to this uh, this get together. Uh, Richard, you and I know each other because every Saturday, pretty much, unless something uh, it comes up in between where I can't be there, um, we conduct the Texans Can Cars for Kids auction at Camp Wisdom and uh, the Marvin D. Love Freeway. Yes, my. and. Um, so, and we've been doing that for a while. Quite a while. I don't even remember exactly how long. I, 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 I think back to about 2010, yeah. right around that era, that oh. particular period of time. Yeah. Um, so, just in, in giving us a brief description of what your duties are as the president and CEO, um, and I, I, of course, I did a little research, learn a little bit more, you know. Um, it's in, based on instructional, organizational, financial management, planning and policy direction, and fundraising and coalition building in the community. That's that's what you do. Yes. We're going to find out more about that in a minute. Uh, you were born in Dallas. Yes. And uh, I, I didn't know that. Yeah, I'm, I'm a local. I'm, I'm one of those kids that grew up here. I, I lived out in West Dallas. So what do you think of the bridges? <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny because we called it the bridge to nowhere because we... <laughs> We, I mean, you build a bridge to West Dallas, it's kind of like the bridge to nowhere. So hey, all of a sudden, but it's improved the streets and uh, and done some other things. So it's it's, uh, it's a good thing. It's raised the pro the uh, property and, values and it's pushed some of some very nice people and good people out of their neighborhood. <laughs> well, that's great. Um, you were born at a different time in America for education <laughs> and yes. what's going on in the in the world today. You've seen the whole spectrum. Yes. Uh, from, well, I, I, how would we describe it? How would you describe growing up in Dallas in the 50s? It, it was a very unique time. Uh, you know, the, uh, the we were such a small group of people because I think we were at that point we were somewhere around two percent of the total population two three percent of the total population mm -hmm. uh, so we we went somewhere under the radar uh, in a lot of ways but we were we we were in neighborhoods mostly you knew exactly where we lived because the neighborhoods were pretty distinctive there was a little Mexico uh, mm -hmm. over there off of Harry Hines and then there was a, another place uh, just south uh, over by the Compton uh, mm -hmm. Community Center. And then there was the West Dallas uh, neighborhood in Ledbetter, where the majority of us lived yeah. and grew up. Which is where you grew up. Yes. And you still, <clears throat> and we were talking before the show, uh, it, uh, the same church you've been going to your entire life, you're still going to Mass every every weekend. Every, su every Sunday morning, it's my Groundhog's Day, I told you. It's kind of like... <laughs> Every, every Sunday morning, I find myself in that choir loft at 9 o'clock in the morning. And so it's kind of like I begin my week and end my week right there. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of an interesting thing to me because my life is kind of defined uh, right there at that moment. Well, that defines stability, yeah. which goes back to the 50s and the 60s, the early years. There, there is a... a an issue related to the whole issue of uh, morals and the issue of uh, character and, and all all the value issues. But you have to understand that we were, I was raised a Catholic kid, so I went to Catholic school all my life. And uh, I, I was influenced by the uh, Irish nun and the Spanish priests uh, because I was, a, as time grew, I figured out that the nuns really didn't have anything, and uh, and so it, it later on in life I realized that those women gave up everything that they had, yep. everything, uh, only to come to West Dallas and educate a bunch of uh, 
little Mexican kids. Yeah. And they did a very good job uh, throughout the years for over 40 years. So it, it it's humbling to think that another human being would give up their life that way. I think um, <clears throat> I think this society that we live in doesn't get it for the most part. You know, the interesting thing that I've noticed, uh, like, is that uh, the pendulum is kind of swinging back. Uh, I think we moved away and, and we went through the selfish era where it was nothing but me, nothing but me. And uh, the irony is that these millennials that we talk about, mm-hmm. I think they have a deeply rooted uh, value system. They're kind of a unique uh, group of people. You know, they, they take longer to marry. Yeah, but they I've stay, seen that. But they stay married. That's the other thing. Yeah. And, they're, and they parent better because they do more research and they think about that, their actions and so on and so forth. And they've watched a lot of things happen. Yes. They've been through a lot, through all these broken homes, broken families, and all these other kinds of things. Uh, so it, I've seen uh, the pendulum swing one way uh, to access and all the other things. And I've, I have see it coming back in, in a very inspiring direction. You know, I've always been one of those that says, there's nothing wrong with America's children. Mm-hmm. Nothing. Uh, it's just... Uh, it's, <laughs> it's the parents. <laughs> well, you know, it, I'll tell you what I used to tell people, and I still say that to people. I said, Look, no, none of us ever, ever got to pick our parents. Mm-hmm. And these children don't get to pick their parents either. Yep. So... The only place where you can make a difference in their lives is in the schoolhouse. Yeah. And so if the schoolhouses do it better, then we won't have a problem with these children. Yeah. Yeah, we uh, even uh, you, you were raised in the 50s. I was raised in the 60s. And I, I, I remember everything about growing up in the 60s. Uh, I can still remember my kindergarten teacher, my first grade teacher. Every single teacher, I remember them like they were here now. Most of them were deceased. Uh, but I, what I remember probably the most was my fourth grade teacher. And, and I, we lived in California for about three or four years. And I remember her name was Mrs. Withy. And her son worked as a, uh, as a substitute teacher. But Mrs. Withy, and this was in Brea, California, in Orange County, I was standing by the window one time. I was kind of always kind of a teacher's pet. I don't know if you can imagine that. But I was standing by the window by myself, and it was either before school or after school. There was nobody there but me. And I was standing at this globe, and I was looking at this globe, and, and Mrs. Withy says, um, Mike, I believe you can do anything you wanted to do. If you wanted to be the president of the United States, you could do that. And I never forgot that. And I never, not saying that I would want to ever be the president of the United States, although evidently almost anybody can do it. Um, but it was just a, it, that was one of those defining moments when your teacher makes you believe you're something. And that's, that's exactly, that's my point. Mm-hmm. Uh, a teacher, a lot of teachers don't understand the actual power that they have over uh, with children. Mm-hmm. And that one good word, can actually create a, a huge difference for a child. You mentioned parents, so let's let's touch on your parents. Tell me about your parents. Um, both my parents were immigrants. Uh, I'm first generation uh, American. Uh, my parents were, both came from Mexico. My mother actually came very young. She was a baby when they crossed uh, the border. Uh, my father came when he was about 15 years of age. Uh, there was a rebellion in Mexico in the late 20s, which was called uh, the Cristero Movement. Uh, It was the, uh, the government was uh, persecuting the Catholic Church. Mm. And so my dad's uh, brother was very involved in fighting the government. And so uh, his parents were killed, his brother left Mexico, and so my him, well not his parents, but my father and his mother both came to the United States uh, as, as uh, political refugees. Uh, and so they, they, my father and my mother met in Corsicana in a little ranch where they were working. Mm-hmm. And uh, they got married. A couple of my brothers and sisters, uh, birth certificates are out of Venice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, eventually they moved uh, to uh, a little house in West Dallas. Uh, my grandfather, my grandmother, and, and my uncles and everybody else moved and uh, 
we all grew up in West Dallas. How many brothers and sisters? Uh, I had uh, 14. Of, I'm one of 14 kids. Uh, three of them died early in birth. Uh, there were 11 of us. I'm number nine. So I tell people, I said, you know, you know why I'm anti-abortion. You know, there won't be any more number nine. <laughs> well, um, your early education in Dallas, where did you go to school? I went to St. Mary of Carmel School, obviously, mm-hmm. until in the eighth grade. Then I left the eighth grade and I went to a Crozier Tech uh, yeah. High School. Mm-hmm. And so, and uh, high school was too easy. Uh, you know, I went, well, you know, you, you, you're going to Catholic school. Yeah. So <laughs> when I got to the public school, it, they, uh, it was kind of funny because on the first day, the lady said, Where and we didn't know what, what classes to ask for, my brother and I, first time we'd been there. And so she said, well, where do you live? And I said, well, we, we live in West Dallas. And she said, well, you're not going to college, so I'm going to put you in these classes. So all of a sudden, I'm in general math and woodshop and all these other classes, and I'm, I mean... I don't know any better, mm-hmm. so I'm doing exactly what my this adult told me needed to be done, and so I never realized it, uh, and until the following year, I'm sitting there filling out my schedule, and my older brother comes by and he looks down and he says, "What are you doing taking these stupid classes for?" <laughs> and I said, "This is what they gave me." And he said, "Give me that," and he walks me to the to the uh, homeroom teacher, and he says to the homeroom teacher. Put him in that algebra and all the other classes. He's too, he's too smart to be in these stupid classes. Put him in this. <laughs> <laughs> so all of a sudden, I'm in the right classes. I'm taking journalism. I'm, I'm in algebra, geometry, and all, uh, chemistry, and all the other things. But uh, if it hadn't have been for him. You might be working on a car right now. Well, and, and here's the other <laughs> thing, though. I actually dropped out of high school. No kidding. Yeah, I'm a high school dropout. I, I'm a pretty mischievous kind of kid. And actually, I was bored in school, and, and uh, so I used to get, I used to skip school. You know, one semester, I skipped 36 days. It's nothing to be proud of, uh, but I passed all the classes, so it'll give you an idea how bored I was yeah. at, at school. Yeah, you were too smart for your own good. Yeah. Did you do any sports or activities outside? No, and that, that's really a lot of the problem as to why I would, I, if I'd have been in some kind of sports at school, mm-hmm. I wouldn't have gotten into all that mess. I would have focused on the sport and getting my grades and so on. So I, I'm a big believer in getting kids involved in sports and, uh, and, and, and pushing the grades. Yeah, absolutely. You got a Bachelor of Arts degree in history from North Texas. Yes. Uh, go mean green. <laughs> I went to North Texas, too. Um, and then a Master of Arts degree in public school ad- administration. Tell me about that. Yeah, well... Uh, I went to I went to North. I'm a graduate of North Texas when I was 28 years of age, so I started college when I was 24. I'm a veteran. Uh, I was uh, I went to the army. I was drafted in '67, came mm-hmm. home in '69, and I worked in a lot of different places between there and the time going to college. But every time I'd work, wherever I'd work, I'd hit the glass ceiling so fast. Yep. I I I started looking around for something different. So eventually, I said, "No, I'm tired of this." So I went to college on the GI Bill. I was married and had a little girl, Monica. Uh, thanks to my wife, she was working, and I was going to GI Bill and then working part time wherever I could. Uh, so I became a teacher. You know, they said, "You know, you have to declare your major," and I said. I, I just want to go to college. And he said, no, you got to have a major. You always had a hard time picking classes. <laughs> yes, yes. And so, they, so I said, you know what? My brother's a teacher and my sister's a teacher. Yeah, I, I don't think I'll try teaching. And it's the best decision I ever made. Mm-hmm. I loved it. I took to that classroom like, you know, it, it, it was like one of the most amazing things to walk into those classrooms because I enjoyed it the feeling of being in there with those kids day in and day out. Mm-hmm. You, did you, <clears throat> who would you say your mentors were? Oh, my God. You talk about numbers. Mike Ramos early on. Uh, my professors uh, at, at, uh, at the college, uh, Dr. Gerald Ponder, who, who helped me learn to teach 
taught me how to do all those kinds of things. And what, what year were you, what years were you at North Texas? I was at North Texas from uh, seventy six to uh, seven, no seventy three to seventy five, mm-hmm. and so Dr. Ponder for one, and then Dr. Jim Huey who hired me at uh, Thomas Edison Middle School, mm-hmm. and who's been a friend ever since. Mm-hmm. Uh, and who pushed me into administration. The reason I got that master's in public school administration is because he walked into my classroom one day with the dean of the school of, of administration and, and said, uh, he wants to talk to you because he has an application. You need to go to school and get your become an administrator. I hadn't been teaching a year, and this man's already got me being an administrator. So I went, I got it. And then before too long, I was uh, assistant principal at Grinder Middle School. Tell me about um, San Antonio. <laughs> How did that happen? <clears throat> well, between all of that, I was at Sunset High School. And let me tell you, I'll give it to you in a real quick synopsis. I was assistant principal at Grinder. I became assistant principal at Skyline for three years. I became principal at Anson Jones Elementary out in Cochran Hill mm-hmm. uh, for two years. Went to Sunset High School for five years. Went to Washington. So you did all this before you ever went to San Antonio? Yes. Ah. I went to Washington, D.C. I was the advisor to the U.S. Secretary of Education on dropout prevention. Mm-hmm. And so came back, was the area superintendent in the Oak Cliff area in Dallas. And then I went to San Antonio as a superintendent of schools in the Harlandale School District. And that was a life-changing experience. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that was quite a life-changing experience. Uh, I realized that as a superintendent, uh, you, you, don't, you can't do what you really want to do, Mike. Yeah. And, and so... Why uh, is that? Because the political board, they all have their own agendas. Yeah. And it's really not about allowing you to get the problem solved. It's about letting, using you to get themselves elected. And in most elections, if you look around, most uh, uh, across the state and across the country, on school board elections, it's either for or against the superintendent. Really? That's it's, a man, it's a mandate. Yes, yes. Well, I'm going to go in there and change the district and get rid of this superintendent. You hear that? It's the hue and cry day in and day out. So the poor superintendent every May, when people are elected to the board, spend their whole time trying to find out if they got a future there or not. Political battles. There's no way you can get your work done. And then what I learned in San Antonio, so many of the people who work in the school district are related to the school board members. Yeah. And so they tell you, we want you to come here and, and make it better and clean it up. And then you start. And you just release a, a bus driver who happened to be the cousin of one of your board members. Mm-hmm. And before you know it, you're backpedaling. And no matter what kind of a good job you do, you're, you, you can pretty well figure you're out the door. So I swore I'd never go back to do that job. You had a, um, what did you have, an $80, billion, uh, $80 million budget yes. in uh, San Antonio? Yes. And you know what? They kept telling me they didn't have any money, and they had a lot of money. As a matter of fact... I fixed all the buildings and put money in the bank with the money they had. Mm -hmm. You put new roofs on all the buildings. You did a sports complex. Yes. You did uh, what would be equivalent with a private school to a a capital campaign, uh, adding buildings. And um, I I read a lot about your what you did there. All with the money that they already had, Mike. Mm -hmm. And that's the same all over the country. You'd be surprised. How much money is actually wasted in those school districts? That's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up. (laughs) So a lot of people are aware, at least the people that I've known for 30, 40 years, know that starting in 1983, I started selling all the surplus for the Dallas Independent School District. And the first uh, contract that I did, uh, all the surplus was being stored over on the the west side of the, the Trinity. And what was that school name you said? Uh, Benito Juarez. It's an, it was an elementary. Yes. Yeah. And it was just piled up. I mean, it was the biggest mess you ever saw. And of course, they didn't. The building wasn't designed for storage. It was designed for classrooms. Yes. And they just piled it in and piled it in. And quite frankly, 
uh, I'll be blunt, uh, it was like a utopia for a small group of individuals that did not want to be on the radar. How's that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So when you talk about waste, you know, uh, there was not just waste, but there was a lot of theft. And and I and here I am. I'm 23, 24 years old, and I'm it's my first exposure to Dallas as far as surplus. I had sold surplus for almost every small school district from Gainesville to Sherman, Bells, Sanger, Pilot Point, all these. Denton, I did Denton for many years, and so then I come to Dallas, and man, that was an eye opener. And then they moved over to Keast next to the Dart uh, Yard. And then I got another dose of that for about 25, 20, 20, about 20 years. But it's, as a taxpayer, it was very hard to watch. And, of course, you know as well as I do, and I'm not just knocking the Dallas Independent School District because it, it's, it's a beast. It's a beast. Yes, and it it's, is. And just like you said, uh, it's hard to control a beast, especially well, when it's politically driven. Yes, it is completely politically driven. So, you, And because of that, the things you know, you do know how to fix those things. You, you, you have been trained, and you are smart enough to figure it out. But the minute you move in that direction, you might as well start filling out your resume. <laughs> and uh, Because if you make that decision, it, it's going to define your moment. Yeah. That, that'll be the hill you'll die on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I believe it. You know, I mean, I, I'm I'm seeing things and 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 looking at things and thinking, where did that where did that where did that mixer go? You know, where did where did that go? Where did this go? And you you know, back in the '80s, we went through this whole period with the FBI investigating, and we had a superintendent that uh, got in trouble for buying furniture for San Antonio at the condo, and then and then I remember because they were very good about presenting. Uh, a front that there was management so there was a rule anything that sold for over a hundred anything that was purchased for over a hundred dollars had to, we had to write the serial number down and we'd have page after page after page after page of serial numbers and what it was and um, and then we had to record the auctions and we rec- we had to do double recordings one for us to hold on to and one for them so if there was ever, it was almost like we, it's almost like they knew they had lots of problems. And so anyway, I just remember at one point, <clears throat> there was a guy named Mr. Jones, and he was sitting out, uh, or Mr. Robinson. He was a uh, nice guy. He was sitting out on the dock one day, and I showed up to do the auction. We would do an auction about two or three times a year. And we did everything from the buses to the food service to any of the vocational education classes uh, down to the portable buildings when they would get rid of the portable buildings. And I just remember Mr. Robinson saying, Mr. Jones, you got a minute? I said, yeah. He said, I just want you to know that the FBI lady says you run a real clean auction. (laughs) So they've been investigating. You know, that makes you really uncomfortable when you think that, you know, you're you're suspect. Well, but not only that, Mike, it, it, it really lends itself to the idea of transparency. Mm-hmm. So you, they, you have to do those kinds of things. Sure. Uh, and, and let's face it, uh, school districts are like any other business. People, are people. You, no matter how hard you work, some people are going to do the wrong things. Yep. And you can't protect yourself from them because you, they look just like oh, every other good person mm-hmm. until they start doing their little things. Uh, so it, I, you know, it's just it's a normal part of life. Yeah. Well, I could, you know, you could write a book. I could write a book. Well, and and it all go back to the same thing. As as long as school districts are political entities, mm-hmm. uh, then the decisions of children's lives and their education is left up to an election in May every year. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was reading some things about your time at Sunset, and uh, of course. Your DC, um, the responsibilities that they were were implying for you or giving you to increase the graduation rate because it was, I guess, anemic in some areas, and and then talking about um, assisted in the graduation rate increasing uh, forty to seventy percent during the time as principal of Sunset High School, that's pretty remarkable. And then it talks about you were recognized by the national media and uh, the Today Show, the Oprah Winfrey Show, and 
Christina show. So there's been a lot of you've had some nice focus on you I have. along the way. And then you also uh, started you had a, a company, uh, Markcom Inc. Tell yes. me about that. Tell me what that did. Well, uh, what I did was I went consulting when I left that superintendency in Harlandale. I swore I'd never go back to the superintendency. Public school, school systems? No, to the superintendent's job. Ah. So I went consulting with a gentleman by the name of Dr. Lee Hanel, and I started doing his work for him. I could do it better than he could because I was a teacher by trade. And so uh, we were talking one day, and he, he told me, he said, you know, you, you need to go on and start your own company. He said, you're getting all these clients who want you. He says, I'm getting all these clients who want you rather than me. You need your own company, and you need to take care of them as clients. So I did. And so while working with the work of Dr. Reuben Feirstein out of Israel, uh, I became very familiar with classrooms and how to teach children how to think. And so I kept working and eventually it evolved into my own systems. I developed a system called Cognitive Development Through Reading Across Curriculum, where basically I can teach any kid to read and think in any subject, which, which changes the whole landscape. And so that's what I was doing. I was building that system as I was working out there uh, school to school. So I was working all over the country. Mm-hmm. I noticed that you worked with Kaplan. Mm-hmm. And I'm very familiar with Kaplan because a, you know, a lot of us uh, actually obtained our real estate classes from Kaplan. You know, and of course, it, before that was like Dearborn or something like that. I think it was Dearborn. And before that, you know, we go back uh, generations of different uh, uh, schools of that nature. But Kaplan's, it's a big one. They're a big one. Yeah. You worked with Grand Prairie SER, Breakthrough Corporation, the University of North Texas, Dallas Community College District. Um and a variety of different schools and districts across the country. So you have you have a pretty good little resume there. Yeah, but you know what? The one thing it did for me is it made me charming. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you're a consultant, you better darn well learn to be charming or you're not going to eat. Well, I believe that's true. <laughs> I believe that's true. So what's the biggest difference between a America can and Texans can from from its – Origination. How old is how old are we now? Thirty. Thirty two. Thirty three years. Yeah. I remember when we had the anniversary, the thirtieth anniversary. So it's thirty two, thirty three years old. You come in two thousand seven. Two thousand seven. What's the difference between then and now? Well, I'll put it in a in a in a financial way. We had uh, eight million dollars in assets and seven million dollars in debt. Uh, today we have. Uh, Thirty-eight, thirty-nine million dollars in assets and about ten million in debt. Uh, we're we're quite a well-functioning corporation, mm-hmm. uh, and so very solvent. And then the other thing is, we're a real dynamic organization now because before we were just concentrating on graduating kids, and we only had the the social side. We were trying to deal with the social side of students' problems. Now we deal with all the problems that the kids bring. Mm-hmm. We put glasses on them. We have counseling. We, we have the only 24-hour, uh, seven-day-a-week hotline counseling system in the country for high schools. So the kid can just pick up the phone and call, and there, there's a certified counselor or psychologist on the other end of the line who will deal with the child's concerns, and it's completely anonymous. How did that <clears throat> How did that come about? How well, did how did you and your board uh, or your te- who whoever your consulting group is how how do you wake up one day and you go you know what we're not just going to work on graduation rates we're going to take this to a different level well because what you begin to do is you look and see all right what's keeping these kids from graduating what's getting in their way first of all you realize that that ninety percent of them can't read on a reasonable level to do much of the work. So what are you going to do? You're going to teach them to read. Also, you know that they make a lot of bad mistakes. They need to learn to think. And so we concentrate all our efforts academically on teaching them to read and think. And so we have one of the most dynamic systems for teaching reading and thinking anywhere in the world. We have uh, Dr. uh, Feirstein's Instrumental Enrichment 
which is a world-renowned system for teaching human beings how to think. And then we have the reading process, which no one else has anywhere in the country either. And so the kids come in, and over a period of time, we're able to get them up to where they can read reasonably, think reasonably, and make good decisions. On the other side, other things that get in their way are simple things like food, like clothing, like a place to live, like a job. Like, I mean, all those kinds of things get in the way of their graduation. So if you're going to continue to graduate them and grow the number of kids you graduate, you have to fill in all those needs. And it's only going to happen at the school. And so now we have dual credit college courses. My God, Mike, I could go on forever. All the things we put into the can to see that the, the kids graduate and then not only graduate anymore, now we're pushing out to see to it that we take care of them even after they graduate. So it, it's if you come to the can today, you're going to walk out of there going, how do you guys do this when the kid's only here four hours? Yeah, yeah. Well, I know when I came on board <clears throat> years ago, we talked almost entirely about um, graduation rates. How many kids came in? How many we would get out? Uh, tell me, um, was it a gradual shift towards the – because I know that we're actually potentially integrating CAN into the regular school systems. Yes. I, I know that's a goal. Oh, yes. Uh, I've, I've learned that about that the last few years, and I'm thinking, well, that's brilliant because you're – you're not isolated to your own island. You're actually extending it into the public school systems. I know you were looking at San Antonio, and I'm sure some other places, we, too. We, have, we are now in a San Antonio school. Mm -hmm. So we're catching them before they drop out of school or before they wind up at our door. And we're, we're having some, some good results. The, the high school we're in is graduating 283 kids this coming year. That's mm -hmm. their number they're, they're hoping to graduate. Well... We're about to add 70 or 80 more to that group. Wow. That's 70 or 80 more kids that they would have lost. Yep. And so this year they won't, they won't lose them. This year they're going to graduate over 350 kids mm -hmm. because we're in their school. How many kids overall, how many campuses do we have now? Well, counting the one in San Antonio, that one in that high school, we have 14. 14 campuses Primarily Dallas, Houston. Six, six in Dallas. Mm -hmm. We have three in Houston now. We have two in Fort Worth, one in San Antonio, two in San Antonio, and one in Austin. Mm -hmm. We have about approximately over 5,000 kids. What's your growth plan? Uh, the San Antonio model. Mm -hmm. It's the most efficient. Makes more sense. It makes fewer, fewer campuses to, up, right. to maintain. Yeah. And, and, you know, the brick and mortar stuff, everybody's moving from brick and mortar so if you can if we can house inside the public school systems we cut down on all their issues all their problems mm -hmm. and we save a lot of the kids sure so when i came on board with texans can cars for kids we were located on division in arlington <laughs> yes and we outgrew it yes we just outgrew it you know when i started over there we were selling the cars uh, outside on a ladder <laughs> <laughs> I remember. It could be 20 degrees outside with a wind chill like today, uh, or it could be 108 degrees in July. And I just remember standing out there going, there's got to be a way, better way, Jesus. There's got to be a better way. <laughs> and uh, and now we have the, the, the new location, which is new to most people. It's not as – I mean, it's, it is a, a fantastic location for us. Yes, you yes, know? it is. And it's, easy, and it's easy to get to. People don't realize. I kind of dreaded it in the beginning because I'm thinking I kind of like being in the center of the Metroplex, but the reality was I never went to the west side of the Metroplex. To, you know, I didn't need to go to Arlington. And I thought I'd have trouble getting through Dallas to get to the, to the location. But Camp Wisdom and, um, and the 67, the Marvin D. Love Freeway, has been really a blessing. Yeah. And, and we're meeting – the needs of the demographic that needs the vehicles exactly exactly that's those are the individuals who need those older vehicles mm -hmm. to get around and have transportation and and yeah it's amazing too the the quality of the vehicles we're getting gets better all the time and we're starting to get unique vehicles that are like 
classic vehicles. <laughs> yes, Our I donations. Will. I mean, I appeal to anyone that's out there listening to this or that are hearing this story because I think it's. I think it is the ultimate uh, American success story of education in a metropolitan area. And I would, I would just tell my friends and neighbors, and, and I know a lot of them. I, I'm always talking to somebody on an airplane because I'm on an airplane three or four days a week. And I'll be sitting there and talking to somebody go, oh, yeah, I donated a car to, to Texans Can or as it used to be called, Dallas Can Academy. Uh, but I, I really want people to go to our, our website, uh, carsforkids.org, and check out – the inventory that we have they can get on uh you know towards the end of the week around thursday friday they can come out to the location on fridays inspect the vehicles uh, get on the internet see what we have they have the ability to register online put two hundred dollars down with a credit card and they can bid and then come in on uh, either the weekend or monday and pay for that (coughs) car i don't know a better system I really don't. And and every week we have two or three really unique, unusual vehicles that are classic. I mean, they're they're classic. We sold an '85 Cadillac DeVille on on Saturday this past Saturday. That was, <coughs> you know, it, it did bring good money, but it was a phenomenal vehicle. You couldn't find it. I mean, you could take it to a car show, and I made that comment. I said you could take that car to a car show. And the week before, we had like a Nova or something. So I I, I tell people that have the funds. If you need a vehicle, a second vehicle, or a third vehicle, or you've got a kid or a, uh, somebody in your family that needs a, a vehicle, you need to come out and check out Texan Scan Cars for Kids. Oh, and, we're there, and we're there every week. I think we're off two or three weekends a year, and that's it. So there's no reason you can't find a vehicle in Dallas that's affordable. You're not kidding. If you can't afford that place, you're, you probably are going to be sitting at home for a long time. Well, and I think it does two things. If I'm a donor and I donate that vehicle, then you can be assured that if you donated a vehicle that we could get back running and get it out, mm-hmm. that some human being is going to get great benefit from that vehicle that you sure. donated. So you, you, you're you actually helping not only the money from, from your donation is helping the kids, you're actually helping somebody in the community with a decent uh, vehicle to get around and go to work. Sure. Um, Zach, I want you to get ready for that spot, but I want to mention real quick before we go there, I, and I've, I've got several more points I want to make before we, before we go. This time goes by quick because we have something to talk about all the way through. And this has been a, this, you know, I've been wanting to do this for quite some time. I've been talking about having you on probably for six months. And so it, it, it almost, it always takes time. P- busy people are hard to catch. Um, <laughs> Over the years, people recognize Texans Can Cars for Kids because of the celebrity spokesman that we've had. We've yes. had a great relationship with the local television stations, from Randy Galloway, uh, who used to be on WBAP, to Dale Hansen at Channel 8, Nolan Ryan down in Houston, uh, and I know all these guys. Babe Loffenberg, former cowboy, and also at uh, Channel 11 here. Um, John sports McKay. Guy. John, John McKay recently. Well, he's he's my last one I mentioned. John McKay, who just retired on Friday from Def- WFAA, and John and I text each other all the time. And I'm and I'm appealing to John to come on this show. I think he's a he is a phenomenal, good human being, one of the best people we could have ever gotten as a spokesman because yes. he's a kind human. And uh, well, his it's his integrity. You know, if that if that gentleman says something's good, you you rest assured. Yep. You just don't get him to do things yep. uh, for anybody. Yeah. Did I see that uh, Cynthia is a Gary? Yes. Is, is she our new spokesman? Yes, that's yes. our new spokesperson. I, uh, the very first fundraiser that uh, Izzy did when she came to Dallas, we did together. And it was for a, it was for a, um, a civic center. I think it was in West Dallas. Um, and I just remember, and she, of course, you know, she's from Dallas. Mm-hmm. You know, she's a Dallas uh, product, and I think she went to North Texas. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And uh, anyway, she's great. She's on Channel 8, so we, we give some shout-outs to uh, Cynthia. And we're friends, we're friends uh, not just in the media circuit, but also on Facebook and stuff like that. People want to know what's going on. You can pretty well catch up with people on Facebook. You ready to run that spot, Zach? Yeah, Mike, I got it ready to go whenever you need it. I'm ready. I guess now's the time. Now's the time. Here it is. Transform their lives. When you donate to Cars for Kids, you're changing the lives of kids who need a second chance at an education and at life. Thanks to your donations, Texans Can has been transforming lives for over 34 years. 
Whether it runs or not, donate your car or truck today. They'll even pick it up for free. Call or visit carsforkids.org to donate today. Remember, right off the car, not the kid. That could have been John McKay. Yes. That sounded like a John McKay spot. <laughs> um, and I'm assuming, uh, Zach, you saw that where I was sitting. Of course, I can't see that monitor. <laughs> and, you know, Richard and I are sitting there going, well, that's a good one. <laughs> that was a great one. Yeah, it's kind of good Now, do you have, did you say you have a video also to show me? I do. I'm just kind of going to kind of roll that in the background, uh, just some B-roll. So don't worry okay. about that. You guys keep talking, okay. and I'll just kind of let that, let that happen. Okay. Uh, tell me about any time you're um, in the executive ladder, of something as successful as America can and Texans can, uh, you got to have people. Yeah, oh, you gotta definitely. Ha- you got to have great. You have to have a team. You have to have great instructors. How many uh, teachers do you have now? We have over two hundred teachers, about two hundred and fifty or more. Mm-hmm. Two hundred. Wow, that's a lot. Well, yeah, and and uh, because the thing that we do is the kids are in front of teachers. You know, most uh, schools that do what we do use computers Mm -hmm. and they hand kids packets we don't believe in that we really want to teach the kids to see that they learn something new and especially if they learn to read my god Mm -hmm. mike we have kids that show up who can't even read a word yeah not one single word wow and so our task is to teach that kid how to read because their potential for life is zero Uh, so you start with zero Every day we keep that kid longer. Every day we teach him more. We teach him how to read. Every day that kid's life changes. They're like sponges. Yes. Yes. Ma'am. And so. Uh, how much harder is it to teach a kid that's um, high school age versus when they're growing up, it, young, it's, seventh, it's, it takes long, third it, grade? It takes, it takes longer. Dr. Fairstein's work proves that they can be taught, that it, they can be changed. But it's a much longer period of time because there's so much more they have to learn than when you're young. So, yeah, it takes longer, but we have to keep them longer. If you have a kid that, uh, let's say a a young man or a young lady that has gotten in trouble and we're trying to integrate them back in the system, how do you qualify them to come back into this system? Well, we we really will take any of them no matter what. You know, it's kind of like what we say. The kid shows up at the can one morning or one afternoon with hope in their heart. They've come to the right place. Mm -hmm. Because the minute they hit that door, we're going to do everything humanly possible to make them successful. And so we're going to, whatever the kid needs, we're going to work really hard to get. Uh, So it's just one of the unique aspects of what we do. Mm -hmm. We... um you and I both know Skyline High School, and <laughs> yes, we were t- we were talking about the um, vocational education stuff. And I'm just going to touch on this real quick because it's kind of a it's an interesting thing that we've gotten into. You know, we used to have vocational education classes where we taught uh, young ladies how to sew. We t- taught young men how to work on automobiles, how to run a welder, how to woodworking, and all of these skills that seem to be missing uh, today. In fact. I honestly don't know that we could run Texas without our Hispanic population because they are the skilled workers that can do all these things. And so many of the, the general population today, they, you know, children today, kids come in, half the time they don't know where food comes from. They yes. think you just get food at the grocery store. <laughs> and they think that every car has to be fixed at the dealership. And these guys just show up and do all this woodworking work. Yeah. So, you know, I, back when I was doing all the auctions for the DISD, we liquidated the vocational education class at Skyline. This has been back in the late 80s, early 90s. And I remember it was a phenomenal facility. I mean, it had everything. It was like the Cadillac. In yes. fact, it was the largest in the United States. Yes. And we auctioned it off. And, uh, I mean, I was glad. I mean, I got paid well. <laughs> but I questioned, the, I questioned it. And I asked the guy. I said, what are you going to put in here? He says, computers. I said, computers. Oh, okay. So now, looking back over this 20, 25 years, what, what do you think about that? What do you yeah. think about education and vocational education? I, I, have to, I have to admit, I was one of the ones who said, uh, because we were not represented in, in the college situation, college circumstances, I was one of the ones that said, no, the kids need to go to college. It, it, what I really meant was we need to be inclusive 
uh, more Hispanic kids need to go rather than be pushed into the vocational. Remember, yep. I went to Crozier Tech. It was the vocational school. Yeah. And all the people in that you know, in that building all had brown faces. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like you were relegated to go to that school because that was your future. Yeah. So it seemed like a negative at the time. What you realize now is a lot of the people I went to school with at that time, when they left, got some very good jobs mm-hmm. that they kept for 20, 30, 40 years yeah. because they, they developed those skills. So right. they actually had a way to feed themselves and become members of the middle class. Sure. So as I look back, I say, you know, you start to think, because I was at Skyline for three years, and they, they had some fantastic places where the kids could learn all those skills and actually move out of there and go out and find a decent job. I think we forgot in America that not everybody is supposed to go to college. Yeah. I, th- I think what we, we got crazy about college. So somebody's got there. I still remember Mr. Guzik was the principal saying to me one day when I had to suspend the kid. I said, Mr. Guzik, if I suspend him for three days, he may not come back to school. He said, Richard, somebody's got to pick up the trash. <laughs> and he said to me, yeah. And that's not a bad job. All you have to do is maintain your dignity and go to work. He said, there's nothing wrong with it. We look at those things as wrong. He said, that that's working, but people need it. And so now we look and we go, we need the plumbers, we need the electricians, we need the framers, yep. we need the carpenters, we need, my God, you're exactly right. So uh, we're partnering with the uh, Texas State Technical College. Mm-hmm. We're pushing our kids there. Where we've got programs all over the place. We have internships. We have uh, the construction trades coming in and hiring our kids. HEB in San Antonio comes in and hires kids. Logistics, truck driving. Uh, yeah, you know they're a huge corporation. Yep. But we've got a lot of people coming in, offering jobs to our kids. We had a kid leave us who learned how to do that ABC pest and lawn, mm-hmm. passed all the tests. That kid left is making $45,000 a year right yeah. out the door. Right. And you go, and uh, uh, one, of the, one of the young ladies that also got the certification, the gentleman liked her so much, the people at the company, they're actually putting her through college. Yep. So, no, we're, we're we. You're, you're aware. We have, Mike, at one of our schools in Fort Worth, we have an actual fully functional optical clinic. The kids have learned how to make glasses, how to do all those things. Wow. And so we're actually bringing people in who need them, mm-hmm. and we're putting glasses on people in that community. That's just a, another reason. What you're, see, it all starts at the top. <laughs> it all starts at the top. Raul, you know what I'm talking about. Absolutely. It's leadership. And, and I, we've had a constant dialogue now for going on an hour and and I love, I, well, that's why I, I can tell you something. You know, um, yes, selling cars on Saturday to support America Can um, is, is something I enjoy doing. Does everybody want to give up every Saturday of their life? No, they don't. But I'm telling you, uh, and I, I showed you this picture, and I'm going to show this. Uh, Zach, I want to show this picture right here. Can you see this? Yeah, I can see that on there. Okay. There was a, a little Hispanic boy that came up to me. And, and after the auction, right at the very end, and he had drawn, the, he drew me a picture last year, and now his, and his name is Luis. And, it, and it, what's interesting is he's got the auctioneer up there. He's got our computer guy. He's got our logo. There's the car coming through. We've got our ringman, uh, Philip and Mario and um, Austin. And the, if you, it's really funny because he on one side he says paint uh, painting by Luis and then on the other side he put Luis de painter <laughs> so he was differentiating you know um, the painting and, and who he was and, and let me tell you something I put him on Facebook I let him come up and, and introduce himself and I showed that and and I told him I said I'm gonna take this I'm gonna have it framed and I'm gonna put it where I can see it every day and let me tell you something th- that kid will never forget that That's right. and his parents We'll certainly never forget it. And I think that's what we're talking about. That's it. It's a people thing, and it's it's compassion and it's love uh, for, for mankind and humankind and, and doing the right things 
to benefit others because we're not here very long. I've been telling people this for the last 20, 30 years. We're just here. We're just a pebble. And we're not here for very long, so we've got to maximize our time. Speaking of that, you uh, you've been with you've been basically working for how many how many years have you been uh, out of college now? Where you've been and and, and wow. not just out of college, but between your military service and everything. What are we talking about? Fifty years? Yeah, yeah. Fifty years. Now you you can only do this so long, so. Are you you're prepared to move a, another five or so, at least five or ten years? Well, I'll put it to you this way, Mike. Every day, every morning I wake up, I want, I've got something else I'd like to see done. You know, one of the things I want to see done is I want to see every kid in, in school learn to read. And I now know it can be done. Mm-hmm. I now know what the answer is. So I have to see to it that we push this thing out and we help people. Uh, because reading and thinking is the thing that will change your entire life. Yep. It will make you who you are. So that has to be done. We want to push out this whole aspect of putting schools, our type of schools, in in high schools so that we stop this constant bleeding of, of human beings going nowhere and, and creating issues for us in the future. So Dr. Fierstein puts it in a very good way. He said only a human can teach another human how to think. So it is about humans. And then the other thing is, you know, I still remember, you know, the nuns and all the others, I remember all they used to say, if you want to save your soul, you have to give it away to other people. And so I still have a lot to give. And because I have a lot to give, I hope the good Lord decides to let me work till my last day. I hope you live to be 110. <laughs> <laughs> You'll find me working if I do. I, I have no doubt about that. I have no <laughs> doubt about that. Raul, do you have anything you want to add or you want to tell us anything about social media? If they want to look up uh, the different places to learn more about America Can or Texans Can Cars for Kids or just Texans Can in general, tell me, give me your, give me your 30 second to a minute overview of what, <laughs> what they can do to Absolutely, check it out. absolutely. You could find all the information about the schools on social media, we're on all social media platforms, including Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and there's multiple ways you can be involved in our organization. We have our event calendars, we have fundraisers as well. And earlier, Mike, you were talking about uh, the auction and you can actually, live, we live stream the auction every Saturday. So you can see the type of vehicles that we have. So it's not only the donation, but it's also purchasing the vehicles as well. And, and one thing I wanted to mention is really beautiful is that uh, w- once we really uh, care for these students, it's just really beautiful to see that it comes full circle because we also have alumni who are now donating to the Cars for Kids uh, organization. So uh, there's, there's many ways you can be a part of, of what we're doing, and, and it's a really beautiful uh, thing. So uh, you, you can find us online. And a lot of the kids give back, too. Absolutely. A lot of the, kid, a lot of the kids uh, give back. They, they participate at Texans Can. Absolutely. And we also have fundraisers. We do golf tournaments, and, and I've played in the golf tournament. You've been gracious enough to invite me to that. And we're always looking for sponsors. We're looking for sponsors. We're looking for table sponsors and things of that nature. So if we have corporate friends or, or P individuals who have the funds and want to, to participate with America Can or Texans Can, we welcome them. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Well, guys, I think we've, we've, we've pretty much covered the uh, overview. And... Um, well, actually, Mike, we, yes, we have a lot more to talk about. So one day, call me back, and I'll walk you through we'll the rest do, of We'll it. do round two. We'll do round two. <laughs> well, I'm thrilled to have you with me because, I, you know, Texans can uh, – takes up quite a bit of my time, and, I, and, and, and it's my favorite time. I told you this earlier. It's my favorite, time, fi- favorite day of the week is when I go do that auction, and I get to do a lot of cool stuff. You know my, uh, my I career. I, I see you. I see you on Facebook all the time and where you are. It's <laughs> I, pretty I, exciting. It is. It is. But I tell you what, nothing's more rewarding than that three or four hours that I'm selling those cars and well, knowing where that money is going and seeing your face show up and being able to introduce you. We had one of our principals show up uh, Saturday, and he came through, and we introduced him. And, and uh, uh, it's always good to see the people. And, you know, we, we want the people to know that there are really people behind what's going on, you know. And that's why we thank the people that work with us at the pay windows, uh, the people that manage mm-hmm. it. 
those are very important. You know, you can't do it without a team. we got a great team, not only at Texans Can Cars for Kids, but also the instructors and teachers in the schools. So. Um, it's like I told the board, at this particular juncture, we've assembled the best team we've ever had at the camp. Yeah, I believe that. I believe that. Raul, I'm going to count on you to get the story out and get this show out there where we can share the information and spread the gospel of America Can and Texans Can. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of myself and uh, Richard Marquez, the President and CEO of America Can, Texans Can, uh, and also Raul, thank you for being here, and we appreciate you being here very much. We look forward to uh, the next episode of the Mike McGavel Jones Show. If you get a chance, come out and see us at Texans Can on any Saturday, uh, and we appreciate you so much. So on behalf of everyone here that's part of this show. Zach, thank you very much. God bless, and we'll see you next time.